Okay, that's awesome. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. That's where we'll start, and we'll be jumping around a good bit, but Genesis 2, 15 will be the, the kicking off point there. Um, as we keep on going here in our, in our kind of topical discussion. If you found that, then I ask you to bow your heads and your hearts, and, and Father, we just love you, we praise you, we thank you for uh, getting us here safely. Lord, we thank you that the storm that came up through the Gulf was not worse than, uh, than it was, it could have been a lot worse, and we thank you for the protection there, Lord, and we just ask you to be with us, Lord, to anoint all that goes on here today, Father, and protect us as we go home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We've, uh, as I said a couple of weeks ago, we got out of our, uh, for temporarily, left our book study to get into something topical because it was just time. This is something that's been on my heart for years, but, you know, sometimes you can get into trouble teaching new stuff just because nobody's heard it before. But the, the reason it needs to be taught is because it, it locks in the meta narrative or the, or the narrative arch, the overarching story from Genesis to Revelation, and it ties things together. Otherwise, people tend to get this splotchy, blotchy story of what's in the Bible, and they don't necessarily know how to connect the dots. A lot of the things we are, we'll be reading about as we go through the, the study, people tend to think are on the periphery small sideline items, but they're not. If it's weird and it's in the Bible, it's there for a purpose. You can't just read over it. And there's structure in the Scripture. It's not just narrative. It's not just history. There is no science in there. I'm sorry if you believe there is. There's no science in there. That's not what's going on. There's a, 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 a theological messaging, no matter what genre, of, of uh, literature you find within the Bible, and it is there for a purpose. But we so often just read over things because they don't make any sense in our day, and so we're not familiar enough with the context, especially the ancient Near Eastern context. We have very little knowledge most of the time of the Greco-Roman context of the New Testament period. And so what happens is we read over things that ancient Israelites or, or, or first century Jews, things that would leap off the page to them, things that in their day would go without being said. All right. So in our day, being 2,000 years removed and on the other side of the world and all that, we just kind of go, what is that? Uh, whatever, and just keep going. And we do that to our detriment. So as we've had this brief introduction so far to what's theologically referred to as divine counsel. I hope you saw last week that it's the template for how God works in and through us. And how He works with His heavenly family up there, heavenly hosts, stars, sons of God, you hear that language over and over. How He works with His heavenly family to mirror things here on earth as they are in His kingdom. You've got to think of it as parallel worlds, universes, the matrix or something like that. But there's a lot more to see. We also need to see, eventually as we're working through this, how Jesus and Satan fit into the plot. And Satan probably doesn't fit into it quite the way you, you think because so much of what we get on the, the dark side of things comes from medieval theology. It comes from Dante's Inferno and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's you don't go to popular literature to get your theology. That's just not the way it works. So, we need to begin to think differently about ourselves and how we fit into God's plan. All of this begins in Eden at the beginning, all right? So, in the beginning, Eden was God's earthly home. Most people don't know that. They just think it was Adam and Eve's home, but it was God's earthly home. We're going to talk about that today. You might say that it was his home office. You could say that it was in some way, I've referred to it before as his summer home. He comes, he's up you know, in heavens, and then he kind of comes down here for a while. And, of course, humanity messes things up. But if I were to ask you, what's the first thing you think about when someone mentions the garden? Most people say Adam and Eve, the fall, the serpent, that sort of thing. That's what always pops in your head. But Eden was Adam and Eve's home. God put them there. But there's a purpose behind that. He didn't just go, ah, 
there's a nice little spot. I'll drop these two folks in there. There's way more to it than that. That's what we're going to talk about. So look at Genesis 2, verses 15 through 25 is where we're going here. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Because God knew if you just have men on the planet, it will never get cleaned up. It will be a mess. And, but, f you know, football would have been invented a lot earlier than it was. But verse 19, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what we would call them, what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman. Now, that's a nice way of saying it, but I don't think he looked up at this creation and went, oh, she shall be called bone of a bone. I think he went, whoa. Because you, what has been happening? God sent him through the whole ordeal of naming the animals, and he's got a blue one and a pink one and a blue one and a pink one and a blue one and a male and female, male and female all the way through, and eventually it dawns on Adam, I don't have a pink one. You know, that's what he's doing. Everybody else has a mate, and I don't. And then, so God puts him to sleep, and then, boom, he, he wakes up, and wow. But the way you write it, especially in King James English, is this is now bone of my bone. Nah, no, that's not. He's a guy, all right? He went, whoa, dude, that's exactly what happened. It's in the Hebrew, look it up. All right. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. All right. So we see that Adam and Eve lived there in the garden, but we don't, all, we don't usually think of this as it also being God's home here on earth. How have we missed this? And then I would ask, we need to ask ourselves, how can we know this? Is this just something Eb is making up or what have you? No, it's not. Ezekiel, Ezekiel refers to Eden as the garden of God. Ezekiel 28, 13, the A portion says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. All right, so make that distinction, that, that correlation there. Eden is the garden of God. Then you go on down to Ezekiel 31, verses 8 and 9, you see, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. The fir trees were not like its bows, and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it, it I'm, garden of God, there's the phrase you're looking for. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches so that all the trees of Eden, the garden of God, there's the connection we're making, envied it, that were in the garden of God. All right? So, uh, what you seems fairly plain, doesn't it? But because this is stuck over in Ezekiel in a prophetic book that many people have never read, and if they do, it gets kind of, there's prophetic and a little bit of apocalyptic language in it, so people read that and they go, like, this dude is weird, he's laying on his side, he's doing all kind of funky stuff. So we just kind of go, all right, that was crazy, and we go to, to something else. But it's tucked in there. But that's the way the Bible is written. And so it's making this correlation here. Ezekiel 28, 14, at this point we see that Eden is not only referred to as the garden of God, but it's also referred to as the mountain of God. And in America, in the West, we go, well, which is it? Is it a garden or is it a mountain? The answer is yes. <laughs> Truly, it is. Are you a splitter or a joiner? Do you, because we see something a little different in the details, we want to make those two different things. No. 
In the Hebrew mind, those meld together. You could, people read Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39, and because there are different details in those chapters, they're trying to figure out, is that the battle of Armageddon, or is it World War III, or is it both? Or is it this, or is it that? Because in this chapter, you got these details. In this chapter, you got these details. In this chapter, you got some more details. They can't be the same. Wrong answer. You're thinking like an American. Stop. Think like a Hebrew. Chapter 37 gives you initial details. 38 comes along behind it and adds to those details. The 39 comes along and adds more details to the, those prior two chapters that were dealing basically with the same thing. So you're getting more and more details as you go. There's no need to split this into two or three different things. It is one thing, and you're constantly getting more and more details about this one event. So if you look at Ezekiel 28, 14, you see it says here, You are the anointed cherub who covers. We'll go into the whole context of this at a different time. But you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. All right, now the point I want to make out of all this is that in the ancient Near Eastern context, bountiful gardens and distant mountaintops were seen to be the abode of the gods. And I'm using plural there, not because I believe in polytheism, but because I'm taking you back to their context. And if they weren't Israelites, they were pagans. And actually, a lot of Israelites were pagans also. But this is what was seen to, things were seen to be, the distant mountain peaks. Even by the time you get to the, to the Grecian Empire, where does Zeus live? Anybody? Mount Olympus, way up there on the, on the top. They're always up there. They're always distant. All right? So as we've seen here in the last few verses, the Bible uses this description of Eden as both a garden and as a mountain. It's all about... Location, location, location. And then you got to understand this. In an agrarian society, that is in an agricultural society, which is what the vast majority of people were living in at that time, people lived mostly hand to mouth. And it only made sense that the gods lived better than the regular people. After all, they're the gods, right? So they shouldn't be living in the, you know, down here in the slum with us in a little ha uh, uh, hut um, trying to just get by with enough to eat for the day and drawing water, going walking miles to get water and all that sort of thing. That's not the way it should work. The only people who lived well in those days were kings and priests. And in the minds of the common people, those people were chosen by the gods anyway, so they were seen to be a step above. And you see this borne out in all sorts of archaeological sites and all sorts of extra-biblical material. Where did civilization begin? Not in the Rift Valley with some monkey named Lucy, I promise you, okay? Just do the, sci just do the research on that. They found a few bones over here, and a long way away they found a few more bones, and they said, let's stick these together. I'd love to see the train that hit that monkey, all right? But that's not where civilization started. It started there a little further east in the Mid Middle East. All right? And it began around rivers such as the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Jordan, the Nile, and others, uh, you know, wherever water was flowing. It's, a, it's this all necessary in an arid climate. If you had an EMP burst over America and it set us back a few hundred years, you know what? And all of a sudden, none of your electrical appliances are working. And you don't have running water or anything else. I mean, think Mad Max or the Book of Eli or something like that, you know, dystopia. And we've all got to go back to living off the land. You city folks, I hate it for you. If some of us are raised in the country, we know how to farm and do the rest of the stuff. Uh, don't come out there trying to steal all my collard greens. That's all I'm trying to say. You say when you plant a garden, you've got to plant enough for you, enough for the relatives, enough for the folks who are going to come steal from you at night. You've got to plant extra. But the point is, if we were pushed back into some dystopian society like that, I mean, and it lasted a while, people are going to start heading for water. You've got to have water, running water, potable water, drinkable water, clean water. You've got to have that, and you've got to have shelter. All right, you sit here in the city and just wait for somebody to drop water. That ain't happening. All right, so that's where civilization begins, and that is a very arid climate over there. 
And surely, this is the mindset, surely the gods live where there is no lack. The rich folks live where there is no lack. And nobody in here, as far as I'm aware, is rich. We do all right. But the rich folks, you know, live in some gated community somewhere where there is, they lack nothing. That is just the way it works. Remote mountain peaks touch the heavens. People didn't live there. Nobody in that day is going, you know what? Let's just put on all our uh, North Face gear and go hiking up into the mountains and let's put on some crampons and let's just, for the heck of it, climb Everest. Nobody's doing that. And they're probably not saying, let's go climb Red Top Mountain or Kennesaw Mountain or anything either. All right? That's a lot of work. When you're, having to ju when you're just trying to get by, all that stuff that we do for amusement, that's, that goes out by the wayside. You are just trying to get by. So nobody is climbing any of these mountains for exercise or anything else. They're, those places are remote, and that's where the gods, quote-unquote, live. All right, and this kept the gods away from all the pesky humans. That's the way they thought. Then you've got this fact that Egypt's temples were covered in, and I'm talking about ancient Near Eastern context, all right, Egypt's temples were always covered in images of beautiful gardens. You probably heard of the hanging gardens of Babylon. Israel's temple, you're probably familiar with the furniture in there, the brass laver and the, the candlesticks, the menorah and all that kind of stuff, and the table of showbread. What's on the walls? And on the pillars, the pillars in there that hold the roof up, they made it look like trees, kind of like what we got going on downstairs. All right, on the walls are planted pomegranate trees and all this kind of stuff. Why? The temple sat over a spring so that the water bubbled up and rushed out. Why? Like a river. So it's not just about the furniture. It's the fact that the temple, which is where God resided on earth, mimics Eden. Why? Because Eden was, the garden was the home of God. All right, y'all get the picture. It's not rocket science. So wherever you have temple imagery, whatever you, what you need to think is presence of God, presence of God, home of God, and you should always go back to the beginning. That is what's happening in the temple. And like I said, Israel's temple, along with most of the other temples in their area back then, had this imagery painted on it. Once again, it just represented the home of God on earth. And the temples in most of these places were built as large complexes. So they had these step pyramids called ziggurats. And I'm sorry, I've been out of town all week because I did not get pictures of them. But you've probably all seen one here there. Tower of Babel. Think of that sort of thing. When they're building the Tower of Babel, they're not trying to build it so high they can get to heaven. That's not what's going on. These were metaphors in stone. It is a man-made mountain. Why? Why a mountain? Because mountains are where the gods live. You even go to Chichen Itza. I've been there and climbed that thing. Whew. And there are no rails, I'm here to tell you. Uh, and for somebody who doesn't like height, it's fine going up. Coming down is another story altogether. It's kind of sitting on your tail and just going down one step at a time. But once you get up to the top, it is a flat spot, and then there's a a room you go into, and they had a jaguar in there. This was, you know, a big deal to them and their theology. But it represents a mountaintop, and only the priest would go there, and that he would commune with God. The same thing is going on in the Bible, all right, in the temple. And outside of Israel, this is before it came a nation, but the, the concept is the same, is that God, in our case, the one true God, lives in gardens and mountains. The other people saw it the same way. Is the Bible borrowing from pagan theology? No. It's called a polemic. All right? They're saying, y'all have got a basic idea of how this works, but you've totally hosed it up. That's what Israel is saying. That's the purpose for writing a lot of this. Is it the one true God? The one true God, yes. But all these other gods you've come up with, and we've talked a little bit about how they came to be. That goes back to Deuteronomy 32. But the point is, once again, that this is the way it worked in the ancient Near East. Israel is not borrowing, borrowing anything. They are correcting an error so that everyone knows you've kind of got a little bit of it, but you've perverted it. And that's what you should see if civilization comes out of 
a, a kindred source. They're right there in the Middle East, and then God disperses them. As the languages change, they start messing it all up. But they still got bits of the truth as they disperse and cover the globe. That's what's going on here. So these large temples were built in complexes, uh, man-made mountains. And what this represented is where heaven and earth overlapped. And that's what you have to see even with the temple in Israel's day. This is where the priests and the people went to find the presence of God and in the pagans' cases, the little g-gods, all right, which are not really gods, but they kind of are. If you're a visitor, I can't explain that right now. We're not polytheists. We're not Mormons. Just stick with us. Show up next week, and you'll get more of the picture. But once again, these places are just metaphors in stone. We see that Eden was a lush, well-watered habitation. Go back to Genesis 2, verses 10 through 14. It says, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. Eden is Eden. It's a big area. There's a garden in Eden, and then you've got Eden, which is a nice place, but it's still not the garden. It's not as separate. It's not as holy. It's not, and though it was good, it's not necessarily as good as Eden. And then outside of Eden, which is just like, say, in Kennesaw or something like that, you've got the rest of the world. But now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. And it is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittakel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Now if you're trying to track these, if you're trying to locate this, you're one of those people who've got to find a garden. You're not going to find it, okay? You're not going to go up and all of a sudden stumble onto like, uh, like Indiana Jones, hack your way through something, and all of a sudden, there it is, and there's the wall. You're not going to find that, okay? It was destroyed. But if you're going by the toponyms or the place names, then it's going to put you in east-central Turkey. That's where all these rivers start from. And there are some, if you want to read David Roll, the Egyptologist, he does some neat work on that. It's pretty interesting reading, but I'm not going to climb up on that hill and fight a battle on it. All right. We also tend to think of God's mountain. If I were to ask you, where is God's mountain? I'd usually get two, two answers, one of two, or maybe two. Sinai, where God gave the Ten Commandments, or Zion, which is what many people think the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That, but at the same time, these two places are both spoken of with garden imagery and a watery habitation. Now, if you go to either one of those, what's called the Temple Mount, which I, one reason I don't believe that's where the temple was built, is built down the hill in my humble but correct opinion. But up on the mount, there's no running water. Also, under the largest stone block, that, gazillions of tons or whatever, they hadn't figured out how they moved it, just a few years ago, underneath that largest block that was supposed to have been put there by the Israelites in the, in the Iron Age, underneath that, they found a Roman coin from 20 A.D. Now, how does that happen? If that block was put there 3,000 years ago. Just something to think about. At any rate, um, even and if you go to wherever you want to play Sinai, whether you think it's where... Um, What's the, what's the group that's, uh, no, the guy that's doing all the movies now with putting it in uh, Midian. Uh, even if you want to follow that track, which I honestly don't think is correct, but I won't fight that fight either. The point is it's arid, all right? So there's not really a lot of trees there. But if you look at Isaiah 33, 20 and 21, you're gonna, you're gonna, it says, Look upon Zion, and that's going to be in Jerusalem no matter how you slice it, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. None of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the majestic Lord will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley or ship with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by. Now, that's talking about Zion. Now, you go there today, that's not what it looks like. So it's talking about a, a futuristic Eden. I would argue what's in the, in the book of Revelation. 
Then in Ezekiel chapter 47, if you, for further reference, you've got verses 1 through 12, Zechariah 14, 8, and Joel 3, 18. But whether Zion or Sinai, however you want to see it as the mountain of God, uh, uh, either one of these are in effect his temple because they're both mountains, they're both gar gar uh, gardens, and God resided there, you know, in a sense, at one time or another. During the time that they're getting the Ten Commandments, God is up on the top of this mountain. Not everybody's allowed at the very top, only Moses. That should start making you think of temple imagery. Only the high priest is able to go in where God is. We read about paving stones there. They're able to go in and eat a feast, some of the people, but everybody else has to stay at the base of the mountain, which is the way the, the, the temple uh, complex worked. Not everybody could go in. That's temple, Im temple imagery. We just read over it. We don't make the connections. What I want you to see is you're seeing the same images over and over and over throughout the Bible, and they're there to, to try to get a point across. Um, an ancient Israelite would have had no problem thinking of Eden as the dwelling place of God and the place from which his council directed the affairs of humanity. We talked about that last week. This is consistent with how Israel's neighbors in the region thought of their pagan gods and their dwellings. But there's an additional theological message in the biblical account, and that's one of the things we want to look for. The message is that <clears throat> this is not only God's dwelling, the mountain, the garden, what have you, the temple. It's not only God's dwelling, but that He desires to live among His people. During the Exodus, they put the tabernacle, which is the first rendition of the temple because it's portable. It, it goes right in the middle of the camp. Later on, the temple is placed where I believe it was, would have been right in the middle of the city of David. So that everything is around it. God is in the midst of His people. He desires to live among His people, and He also desires to allow them to, to participate in His rule. And had the fall not occurred, humanity would have been glorified and made part of the council. That's the end result of this thing. That's what you see by the time you get to the book of Revelation. But He knew what was going to happen. God made a way of salvation in order to bring believers back into the family of God. Look at John 1.12. Look at some of this family uh, language we've got here. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. The King James says, gave he them the power to become the sons of God. We've seen that phrase. Who's it speaking of? The council. All right? Keep that in mind. To those who believe in his name. Eden is described in Ezekiel 28, 2, as the seat of the gods. Look at this. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, little g, that's an Elohim, I sit in the seat of the gods, Elohim plural, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, Elohim, then you set your heart as the heart of a, a God, this is the word Elohim again. But look at the middle of that verse, I sit in the seat of gods. The term sh seat should be familiar to you. County seat, congressional seat, what kind of picture does that paint? We're talking about power and authority and the, abil the ability to make decisions. That's what those guys do. But then we just read in John about one day those who, th those who believe, he gives them the power to become that same thing. So when we get a new body, when we see him as he is, we shall be as he is, then that the Greek word there, oikotereon, um, we get that new body, we get that new position, and we're kind of in that same realm at that point. I hope you're starting to put the pictures together. There's nothing heretical in this. This is just simply us being made into what God wants us to be at the end of things. Ezekiel's words draw attention to Eden as a seat of authority and action. But just what you have to understand is that God had plans for the whole planet, not just Eden. And that brings us to this concept. And you've heard me poke at it here, here and there over the last several months. And that is that the, the concept of God's imagers. And one of the first verses in the Bible tips us off to the fact that both God and His counsel were in Eden. All right, so we're, I'm, I'm just hang with me. Genesis one twenty six says this because we want to define eventually what an imager is. 
Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Here we go. This is talking about the dominion mandate we talked about last week. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So here we have, listen to what's going on. All right? Thinking. We're thinking now. We're thinking. We're working through this. Okay? Here we have God announcing His intentions to a group. So we've got to ask, because He uses the plural. Let us make man in our image. Mankind, the word is Adam, where we get Adam. But speaking here of mankind, the context determines the meaning. To whom is he speaking? When he says, let us make man our image, the first answer I'm going to get is the Trinity. Can't be. Can't be. He can't be speaking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He's got to be. No, he doesn't. And he can't be. But why? Let's think. Right here, kidneys, man, kidneys. Use your kidneys, all right? Many would say he is speaking the Trinity, but that once again, that can't be the case. It is in this verse, think about what's happening, that someone else learns of God's intentions. That's why he says it. Let us do this. Someone else is learning of God's intentions. And because that one single fact rules out the Trinity. Why? Because God can't know something the rest of the Trinity doesn't. Yahweh, the Father, can't know something that Jesus doesn't, that the Holy Spirit doesn't. Now, the one rebuttal, somebody say, well, there are times in the New Testament that Jesus didn't know everything. Well, that's in his humanity. All right, that's a different uh, matter altogether. But the point is that there, all three of them sitting there, God can't know something that the others don't. They're all the same essence, all right? So the same brain kind of running through all of them. That's hard to explain, but that's what's going on. If there's something that the Father knows and they don't, then the, the Son and the Holy Spirit cannot be omniscient, that is, omno, all-knowing. If there's something He knows they don't, then they can't be all-knowing. If they're not all-knowing, by biblical definition, they cannot be God. It's pretty logical, isn't it? It's not rocket science. We just had to think a little bit on it, all right? No one, in the, no one in the Trinity can know anything the others don't. Therefore, God had to be speaking to someone else. And you only got one other option. The divine counsel. Because where God is, normally they are also. In Eden, which is his summer home, uh, office, whatever you want to call it, right there. Think of it this way. All right? This, this is what he says. Let us make man in our image to try to, to put some feet on this. Think of it this way. If I say to a group, let's go get some burgers, that's clear enough. Now hold that thought. Eb said to a bunch of you guys, let's go get some burgers. All right? Hold that somewhere in the back of your mind. All right, now let's think of, think of this. While God makes his intentions known to someone else, he doesn't include the group in bringing his decision to fruition. Now, we saw in the last couple of weeks that in the uh, instance with King Ahab, God comes to this, he says he's sitting there amongst the Elohim, the little G gods, and he says, all right, I'm putting a hit out on King Ahab. How do y'all think it ought to go down? And then it says, this spirit says this, and this one says this, and one says this, and one of them says, I got it. I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And God says, That'll work. You get the contract. All right? Take him out. Whack him. You know, that's what's going on here. And when God said, determines it's time for you to get whacked, you're going to get whacked. There's no way out of it other than maybe repentance. But the point I'm trying to make is, in that instance, he allows them to take part. But now, when it comes to creation, he doesn't. Let's get back to the burgers. If after announcing, let's go get some burgers, I drive to the burger joint and I insist on paying. That could be a rarity. But, and if I drive and I insist on paying, I'd be the one doing all the work. And that's what's going on here when God says, let us do this. Because the next few verses, he says, let us do it. Let us go get some burgers. And then he does all the creating himself. And he has to. Because these other, this divine council, they don't have that kind of power. All right? They are created beings themselves. All right? Do you have to understand that? They are called little g gods because from the human standpoint, they're up there. 
but they are not God. They're not omniscient, all-knowing. They're not omnipresent, everywhere, at all times. And they're not omnipotent, all-powerful. They are created beings. So think of it this way. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you've got this divine council that, create, that contains a few different groups of subjects. And then you've got angels, who are simply the step and fetch it, as they say back home. You know what a step and fetch it is? On a construction site, hey boy, go step and fetch that and bring it back here. It's a step and fetch it, all right? He's the one pushing the wheelbarrow, toting stuff, all right? They're step and fetch it. They're messengers. That's all the word means, all right? So, uh, if you got that down, then we need to ask ourselves this. What happened to the our image wording in verse 26? Because this exchange between verses 36 and 27 reveals a fascinating point. Because God's talking not to the Trinity, but to somebody else. But he says, let us make mankind in our image. All that it can mean is that he and the ones to whom he, he is speaking uh, have uh, and they share something in common. He shares something with this other group. What is that? Because whatever that is, humans will also share it once they're created. Remember, we're, this is prior to Adam and Eve. So when they're created, they are going to share something that God already shares with these guys. Not only are we like God in some way, but we're also like the council members. Ooh. Shouldn't change anything. It's, then that something that they are, that they are like, is, communi is communicated by the phrase image of God. So to be human is to be God's imager. All right? Saved or lost. Your purpose here is to image, to reflect God, to show people in some way what God is like. We are God's representatives on earth. That is big time in your theology because you see straight out of the gate, that is why mankind was created in the first place. To be an imager of God. Not necessarily you say in the image of God, it could totally be rendered as the image of God. So let's define that. The image of God is not an ability that's given to us by God like intelligence or something like that. We can lose those abilities. There are obviously some people that have more of those abil certain abilities than others. But we as humans cannot lose the status of being God's imagers. Think of it this way. If being an imager of God only means some sort of intelligent potential or something, if that's what it means, then you've fallen into the hands of the pro-choice people. Because they say that fetus, as they call it, that baby is just potential life. Because as soon when the sperm meets the egg and conception has happened, that single cell organism that comes about is not able, there is no real intelligence there at that point. Not able to make any decisions. Not able to do any of the things that we take for granted. It is, it is technically potential life. If that's what you see being as in the image of God is, is being in, having intelligence and uh, free will and all these other things. Are y'all tracking with me right here? But if any, any human is the imager of God, then it, that, it happens at, and that happens at conception. They are, uh, they are an imager at that point because they are human. Whether they possess a brain or anything yet or not. So if you see being an imager of God as having these potential things, you have fallen into the trap of the pro-choicers, seeing it as potential life. Now, how do we do that? Because we nobody's thought it through. We just kind of do what we do, get our bumper stickers and run with them. All right? So the image of God isn't any ability that's given us by God. We can lose those abilities. But we as human beings cannot lose the status of being an imager of God because we're human. We can't be anything else. So we are an imager. That would, to not be an imager would require not being human. Every human from conception to death will always be human and will always be God's imager. And this is why all human life is sacred. I'll touch on this in the recap. So how do we represent God if that is our purpose here? We've already seen that God shares his authority with the divine beings on this council. He does the same with us. God is the high king of all things visible and invisible. He rules the council and shares that rule with the council and humans. 
God eventually showed us how to represent or image Him with the example of Jesus. Jesus is called the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 and 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. I'll get, we'll get later, we'll talk about firstborn and what that means. He is the exact image of God, Hebrews 1 3. Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image, there's your word, of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. you got throne language. you got a court uh, imagery going on there. And we are to imitate Jesus for this reason. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed... That's what we call sanctification now. You get the glorification at the end of the journey, which is when you get that body and you get to walk through walls and zip around, all the neat stuff. All right. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Romans 8, 29, For whom he foreknew... He also predestined, we'll deal with that later, it's not nearly as complicated as you might think. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we'll deal with all those technical things that send, tend to send people through the roof, uh, predestination, all that later. Like I said, it's not nearly as complicated. That's one of the things this teaching does, it simplifies those very things. But are you picking up what I'm putting down? Humans are basically God's administration here on earth. We were made to enjoy Him and serve Him forever. And our role parallels the role of the council, God's heavenly family, the heavenly host. And this all goes back to the dominion mandate that we talked about last week, given to Adam and Eve, the mission of His imagers. They were to serve God, all right? Put yourself in their position, because in a real way we are. They were to serve God as steward kings over creation. They were to multiply over the entire planet and thereby grow the kingdom of God. Today we share the gospel of the kingdom. That's the same essential thing they're doing, supposed to do in the, in the garden. But Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve failed, as did their children. And had that never happened, eventually the whole planet would have become a global Eden and we would have enjoyed that reality. It will happen that way, but God's kind of had to reboot, it's a crude way of putting it, reboot a few times throughout the Bible to get the, the plan uh, going. And now we are in the last plan of that, which is sharing the gospel, uh, believing in Jesus, the church, all that sort of stuff, all right? Because God loved His creation, He forgave Adam and Eve, but all of mankind was destined to follow that pattern. We've all sinned, and without God's intervention, we all deserve death. Romans 6, 23 clarifies that. But all of this stuff should help us to explain a bunch of things in the Bible, such as why the Bible refers to believers as the sons of God or children of God, because it's a family. We talked about that last week. It should explain why believers are described as being adopted into the family of God. Once you believe, you are brought into that family, okay? Why we are said to be heirs of God and His kingdom. Why we are partakers of the divine nature. Divine nature, divine counsel, their nature, we get to partake of that. You get there? All right, it should be coming together. Why after Jesus returns, He says He will grant to believers to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Going back to Eden. We get to eat of that fruit. It's not an apple. It's not a pomegranate. It's not a banana. I've seen the technical papers trying to prove that bananas were the tree of life. Well, they don't work anymore, I'm here to tell you, as good as they are for you. It talks about why He has promised to share the rule of the nations with us, Revelation 2 to share His throne with us. Think about that in Revelation 3. This is what we will do in a global Eden in eternity. You won't be floating on clouds, playing harps, singing 24-7. I'm comforted by that. That's the last thing I want to do is just bouncing around, sing as much as I love to sing, playing a harp. 
Let me play a guitar. That'll be fine. But a harp all day, no. We will inhabit, we will enjoy and relish and rule in an unblemished creation. So, having said all that, why does all that matter to us? Because this is the application. All right? Living consciously in the knowledge that our lives represent God and further His plans, even if we don't yet see all of that plan in its fruition, should change the way we approach each day. If it's just about saying a prayer and trying to do as best you can till you die and go to heaven, then, hey, that's, you know, that's just make as much money as you can and try to live as comfortably as you can. That's not our purpose here, all right? But if we are placed here with the same dominion mandate as Adam and Eve and placed here to be imagers of God, that should change how we go about our day. The dominion mandate wasn't forgotten after the fall. It's repeated after the flood. God says the same thing to Noah. He's starting over. It's kind of a reboot, all right? That's Genesis 8, 17 and 9, 1. Eden was lost, but God wants it to be restored, and one day it will be. That's what you read in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. Ultimately, God's kingdom will return in its full scope and glory when Jesus returns, and that will look a lot like Eden. Just read Revelation 21 and 22. And just the, the rivers and the fruit and the tree, all of that. But until that happens, we spread the gospel of the kingdom everywhere. We, are, we represent God to everyone everywhere. Not just in here. Out there. That's the mission field. This is just refreshment and training and then go out there. If this is the essence of your Christian experience, your spirituality, you are as messed up as a football bat. Yeah, there's no such thing. Invent, try to imagine one of those. If this is all you have, you are in a sad state of affairs and you need to talk to Jesus. Out there is where we image, is where we show it, where what comes, what's supposed to be in us comes out to show the people around so they go, you know what? They've got something. They've got something. I want that. And they go, what's up? And then you go, let me tell you. And you don't say, say this little prayer so when you die you go to heaven. No. Where do you start? Start with the history. Go back to Eden. And you tell them all this stuff. And that'll kind of go, I mean, whoa, that's pretty neat. Otherwise, just say this prayer and everything just zaps and you're just, everything's groovy now. That's a divine platitude to most people. That's, they've heard that, that doesn't seem to work. But we represent God to everyone everywhere. We are God's agents to restore Eden to some degree, looking forward to when Jesus returns to establish Eden in its full glory as only He can. Consciously thinking of ourselves in this manner as God's imagers means the decisions we make really do matter. It's a lot of them that we do without consulting God. We should consult Him. The decisions we make really do matter. As Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, we can fulfill His plan for us. Here's one that I'm going to listen to what I'm saying because this is loaded in our, what we're going through now with the civil unrest. So hear what I'm saying and don't hear what I'm not saying. All right? What I'm about to tell you is true straight out of the Bible. How it is framed in the narrative that we're given and is blasted through the media is something else. All right? So I don't want to try to clean all this up. I don't have time for that. But listen to this. The knowledge that all human life is sacred. I don't care who, what color you are. I don't care from what country you come from. I don't care what your socioeconomic status is. I don't care whether you got a Ph.D. or you can't read or write. That does not matter to me one iota. Could not care less. Don't say could care less because that means you could care less. It's supposed to say I could not, couldn't care less about any of that. All human life is sacred since all humans are imagers. All humans are imagers because they're created in, in, in the image of God. No matter where you are, what you are, your political theory or anything else, you're imagers. Don't equate that with salvation. That just means that you're human. 
That fact helps us to see life as the sacred thing it is. This should impact how we see everyone. So, here we go. All right, this is loaded, but hear what I'm saying. Injustice. If everyone, if all life is sacred, injustice has no place in the kingdom of God. Racism has no place in the kingdom of God. The abuse of power anywhere, in any form or fashion, in any context, has no place in the kingdom of God. It's not how God dealt with His children in Eden. All right? I don't think anybody who claims to be a Christian would argue with that. Now, how you work that through the narrative of the narrative that's being fed is something altogether different. That's a different conversation, and I'm not going to get political up here. But you cannot say, from a biblical standpoint, that all human life is not sacred. It is, from conception to the grave. No matter what color, what culture, or anything else. All the same, level playing field before God. You had better know that. One thing you see, if you start learning what the law, what Torah means, when you start learning what the Old Testament is saying, is to, to oppress, especially in, in the Bible, women and children, that's bad juju. God does not put up with that. All right? That's why a lot of those laws are in place. Now, don't read that into a one particular political theory that you're, you're hearing nowadays and say, Eb saw this and now Eb is woke because I'm not. Love to have the conversation. If you want to hear statistics, I'll give them to you all day long. So I'm not trying to be woke here. I'm saying what the Bible says. All life is sacred. Now what you do with that and how you try to apply it is, is something different and it tends to get political. Lastly, representing God means that every job that honors Him is a spiritual calling. Each day uh, and every job or task can be part of of moving back towards Eden and blessing fellow imagers, or not. Depending on what the job is. Whether you're a mechanic, a banker, people think, oh, doctors and nurses are helping people, but maybe a banker, not so much. Without a banker, you, you can't get things done in the economy. Without uh, accountants, or uh, chiropractors, or engineers, or I'm looking, I'm trying to, you know, guys that sell motor parts or anything else, engine parts, whatever you do, that is a task that can be honored, honoring to God. You don't have to be in ministry to think that you are honoring God. That doesn't work. Um, uh, God cares how each of us represent Him. And being in ministry does not put anyone on a higher plane, I'm here to tell you. There are as many dirtbags in ministry as there are in politics. That's just the way it is, or any other field. You got good doctors, you got bad doctors. You got good accountants, you got bad accountants. Y'all know you got good mechanics, you got ones that could tear up a steel anvil with a rubber mallet. Y'all know how that works. The only thing is, whenever uh, that we need to represent other, a God to others, whenever and wherever we are, the opportunity doesn't need to be flashy or spectacular. The opportunity only needs to be taken. It only needs to be taken. Blue collar, white collar, no collar, it doesn't matter. You are an imager. But as awesome as God's plan and original intent was, it quickly fizzled in the hands of man. Only God is perfect. And this is something we'll start working into next week. You've got to understand this. Freedom in the hands of imperfect beings, even divine ones, can have disastrous results. Tune in next week for that. All right? I hope in the application you've seen what some of this is, where I'm not being technical. We can delve into every point for three hours. I'm trying not to be technical. But you need to see, if nothing else, how this affects God's plans with us, how it affects our relationship with Him and others, and how it actually gives us a purpose. Would y'all bow your heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you. We praise you for your purpose, your plan, your call, Lord, and how that has worked out over all these vast centuries and millennia. Lord God, we thank you for that, that we're able to be a part of it, and that right now, at least, we're able to live in a country where we're free to do those things. We're not under the oppression, maybe as yet, of our brothers and sisters on the others, in other parts of the world. So therefore, Lord God, 
we need to see this and take advantage of this time because it may not always be this free. So, Father, we love you and praise you. I just pray that we'll chew on these things. Lord, we'll go through the notes, maybe, what have you, and learn. This is so awesome. It's so deep what you are saying throughout your word that ties all of it together, puts us in our, puts us in our place, and puts the other players in the play in their places also so we can actually understand what's going on. So it becomes more of a mosaic, a color, a color commentary, Lord. So we're watching this story unfold in high def color on a plasma screen and not the little old black and whites that I grew up with. Lord, help us to see that. Help us to be your imagers. Empower us, Lord God. Keep us safe, we ask, until next time. Be with those, Lord, that, that have to make the hard decisions regarding all that's going on here today in our world. Lord, and we just, I ask you one thing. Please hurry up and come back soon. We love you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Y'all don't forget about the blessing bags. Y'all be blessed. Be safe out there in the rain. Hope to see y'all next time.